MR imaging in endometriosis. It itself is a quite a detailed topic and this is now one of the most upcoming indications for MRI because a lot of surgical options are there for treating endometriosis and there are recurring endometriotic uh, spectrum also now patients are having recurrent endometriosis, recurrent adhesions and accordingly they have to plan surgery. So if you see the spectrum, it can have in multiple compartment wise you can divide the pelvis and also the abdomen and pick up these endometriotic deposits. So to begin with it can be uterus and ovaries themselves. Then it will be the deep pelvic endometriosis and the superficial pelvic endometriosis. So we will see them. Symptomatically you will definitely have the patient presenting with symptoms. It is very unlikely that it, a symptomatic health checkup patient will present to you with an endometriotic spectrum of findings. Deep pelvic endometriosis can have chronic pelvic pain and why is it important to know this because sometimes the uh, symptoms may be unrelated to the menstrual cycle as well. So painful constipation, catamenial diarrhea, rectal bleeding, something like pneumothorax and epistaxis have also been described. But whatever the symptoms are, they will be cyclical. So if you uh, just ask your patient about these symptoms, are they cyclical, you will see that there is a correlation. Uh, why is constipation and all important? Because uh, the retroverted uterus is also ancillary finding in the endometriosis spectrum. So just by the shape of uterus and just because it is close to the rectal wall, um, you may be missing macroscopic deposits, deep pelvic deposits, but just because of those proximity, the patient might have this kind of uh, painful constipation. So the sites are intrapelvic ovaries, uterosacral ligament, Cirrhosal surface, fallopian tubes, rectosigmoid colon, vagina, cervix, bladder and ureter. So that is the intrapelvic compartment. And extrapelvic, virtually any anatomic location. So people have presented and they have also given like publications are there for intraspinal, intracranial endometriotic deposits. So that is also there. So any site is possible but very, very rare. But ideally at least abdomen you should do few sequences to just document there are no other deposits elsewhere apart from the pelvis. So abdominal wall, surgical scar sites, diaphragm, so subdiaphragmatic deposits are common, liver, kidney, pancreas, bones and brain. And then coming to the spectrum. So now uh, after all the modified criteria, now they have come up with the NZN criteria for endometriosis. Again like the ACR ORADs. NZN is also available online and you can go through the stepwise approach to the endometriosis. It's like a combination of MRI and laparoscopic findings. So again, we have to take out our part out of it and use it for our reporting templates. So superficial endometriosis is deposits which are very small and identifiable only at laparoscopy. They are located on the peritoneal surface or very close, less than 5 millimeters from it. So you cannot see them on MRI. Endometriomas are those cystic structures with hemorrhagic content. So that is the endometriotic cyst. And deep endometriosis, they are the uh, implants which are located at least 5 millimeters away from the peritoneal surface and they may invade the retroperitoneal space as well as the adjoining pelvic organs. So these two we have to identify and comment upon. So role of imaging will be to know the extent of the disease, to describe where all the endometriotic implants are present and also talk about additions as a complication of this spectrum. So two modalities which will be helpful are ultrasound and MR. Ultrasound will identify these but again sensitivity of MR will be much higher. To begin with the patient will have ultrasound done. And also it will have the advantage of being dynamic. So all of us who do ultrasound also know that there is loss of sliding sign. And while doing transvaginal also we can elicit it. And then we say that there are chances of adhesions between the ovaries and the uterus. So not going into the ultrasound appearance but now to the MR. So MRI, uh, the sensitivity and specificity ranges from 69 to 92 and 98. So very high sensitivity and specificity for these endometriotic deposits. And this is the protocol which we are using for endometriosis. So we call it the endometriosis protocol. And now also the referring physician, they are writing endometriosis protocol. So somewhere they are coming across it during the conferences and they want a specific protocol for it. So you start with your antiperistaltic agent like buscopan, empty bladder or partially distended. Empty is good enough because MRI will anyways take 30 minutes and you will get some partial filling of the bladder. Starting with the sagittal titubated sequence, it will be very important. 
and the axial and coronal T2, axial T1 non-fat set and axial T1 fat set. Because we are looking for blood products, the mainstay sequence will be T1 fat set because it will look bright. Then high resolution sagittal 3D T1 fat set. So that is another important thing which we do. I will show you that sequence and that is for surface deposit. So on GE we call it lava. So T1 fat suppress sequence in 3D which is taken in sagittal plane. Diffusion has a limited role in endometriosis per se. You can just perform it and again contrast has also a limited role in it. Screening abdomen as we said to know the extent. So your typical appearance all of us know T1 bright because they are blood products and also bright on T1 fat set. So that is our typical description hyper on T1 and not getting suppressed on T1 fat set suggestive of blood products. T2 positive shading. This is important because these are blood products in different stages of degradation. Every cycle it's bleeding. So inside the blood products are at different stages and of different density. So they are kind of layering inside and giving this positive shading sign. So it's like a level which you see a gradual level on T2 weighted sequence which is called as a positive shading sign. And that helps you to differentiate endometriotic cyst from a hemorrhagic cyst. Hemorrhagic cyst will not have a shading sign because it is just a one time hemorrhage within it. It will have just like a network or a mesh like appearance because those are like resolution of the hematoma and hemorrhage. But this shading sign is typical for endometriotic cyst. And we have seen it even for smaller cysts. It's not that only large cyst will show it. Even uh, one centimeter size cyst also shows this shading sign. Then T2 dark spot sign. This is a sign of chronic hemorrhage. A very dark T2 bright spot eccentrically placed. And diffusion and contrast they don't have much role. So this is another example of shading. You can see that there is a shaded appearance and a gradual fluid fluid levels as you can see on T2. This is that dark spot sign which is non-enhancing dark spot we saw in ORADs. They were not giving any ORADs higher value to these dark areas. Absolutely T2 dark non-enhancing. So that is seen with endometriotic cyst. So comparison endometriotic cyst hemorrhagic cyst. Endometriotic cyst have smooth Shading sign positive T1 bright, hemorrhagic cyst have these mesh like appearance, they will not have shading and if even if you may have doubt till end then you can just follow up. So hemorrhagic cyst should resolve and endometriotic cyst will not show that kind of resolution. So ultrasound is good enough to follow up. Uh, again T1 also hemorrhagic cyst sometime may be hypo intense. It's not that it has blood and it will be hyper intense. So because it is slowly, slowly the methemoglobin part is going down. So it can come back to its normal T1 hypo intensity. But endometriotic cyst will always be T1 bright. So that was about how they appear the typical endometriotic cyst and endometriomas. This is the high resolution 3D T1 sequence which we were talking about that is fat suppressed and the smaller surface deposits can be picked up easily on this sequence. So if you say two best sequence then it will be T2 that is sagittal T2 which you have taken and sagittal T1 fat suppressed sequence. So smaller endometriotic deposits on the surface which have caused adhesions and they can cause a problem during the surgery as symptoms also. So here you can see this is a hypo intense area in the torus uterinus which is the junction of the uterine body and the cervix. So that is the most commonest site where you get this deep pelvic endometriotic deposit. So when you are reporting these cases see the sagittal carefully and see if this area you can find out something which is ill-defined having some kind of speculations or if the rectum is quite flushed with the loss of fat plane between. So that is suggestive of some kind of deep pelvic deposit. So a lot of examples you will see if you even retrospective go and see your cases. It may also go anteriorly invading the urinary bladder which is relatively uncommon but known. So again T1 fat set will show these kind of deposits on uh, anterior wall of the urinary bladder. Then scar endometriosis. So scar endometriosis is very easy to find out if you take the patient's history. They will themselves give you the site of scar endometriosis because they have pain at that site. So the, if you put a vitamin E marker, underlying the marker only you will find the scar endometriosis. So during some previous surgery, the path which was followed mostly the anterior abdominal wall get this kind of deposit which are typically hypo intense on T2, T1 may have those tiny hyper intensities like adenomyosis and speculations and cyclical pain will be a typical sign which your patient will uh, point towards. 
adenomyosis is also a part of the endometriosis spectrum the mechanism here is different so here with the difference is that in adenomyosis these implants are traveling from the submucosal aspect to the subserosal aspect uh, how they have described the pathophysiology whereas in endometriosis deep pelvic endometriosis what we call as the surface deposit the implants are starting from the surface and getting inside so both of the phenomena are independent of each other it's not that these adenomyoses will in future go out of the serosa and form the serosal deposits so you can have serosal deposit even in a normal uterus because it's a separate pathophysiology so that is why we should know that adenomyoses is from submucosal aspect outwards and these serosal deposits are from serosa inwards so two separate independent entities a typical appearance of uh, what you call as a frozen pelvis it's a kind of little layman term but here you can see that the ovaries are flushed with the uterine margins and that is suggestive of underlying adhesions and combination of smaller endometriotic deposits so this is important to be put in your reports as well because during the planning of their surgeries they want to know this uh, so uh, just one slide about this classification this is the new thing which now 2021 enzian classification has come up for comprehensive non invasive and surgical description for endometriosis so now there are uh, gynax who are working with this classification so they want us report like that only now again it has systematically divided the deposits into these uh, compartments peritoneal ovarian tubal and deep pelvic endometriosis and everything has been described like the distance how much is the spacing the site whether it is as a torus uterinus or not and then accordingly the bulk of the disease has been described so now we can use because a part of it is laparoscopic also so that why we have to remove and use it as mri purposes to give us the complete picture of pelvic endometriosis so with this i would like to conclude uh, this uh, short session so endometriosis is one of the most important indication nowadays for pelvic mri and you should try and follow this kind of a reporting protocol thank you for your listening